John chapter 19, this is uh, the second message in our Easter series. Last week we looked at um, the Garden of Gethsemane. The name of this series is Gethsemane, Golgotha, and the Grave. And whenever we looked at the Garden of Gethsemane, we saw the events that took place there. and Our Savior, Jesus Christ, the struggle, the sorrow, and ultimately the submission that he had to the will of his father. And what he was submitting to was to take on the full cup of God's wrath for sin. And he concluded basically by saying, not my will, but thine be done. What a great example for all of us who are children of God. This week we're going to be looking at another place called Golgotha. It's the very place where the wrath of God itself for sin was poured out on Jesus. I want to go ahead and just jump right into the passage. We're going to skip around just for sake of time, though there is a lot of good information in John 19. I encourage you to study it as you make your way up to Easter Sunday. But we're going to start on verse 1. We'll go to verse 3, skip down to 16. I'll tell you where to go as we make our way through this. Verse 1 says this. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers platted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they smote him with their hands. Skip down to verse 16, if you would, please. Then delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified. Now what has happened is Pilate has had Jesus scourged, and he was hoping to satisfy the bloodthirst that the religious Jews had concerning Jesus. I think it's on. It is on. We lost our sound guy. He must have had too much to eat as well. There he is. All right. (laughs) So he has taken Jesus, had him scourged. Jesus has been returned back to him. And he presents Jesus before the the angry mob that the religious Jews had incited. And again, hoping it would appease them. Instead, it just aggravated them even more so. They began to cry out, crucify him, crucify him. So he runs back in. He has a very nervous pilot, mind you, has a conversation with Jesus. To no avail, he finally comes back out. And that's where we pick up in 16, where it said that he delivered him, therefore unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away, verse 17. And he, bearing his cross, went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew, Golgotha, where they crucified him and two other with him, on either side one, and Jesus in the midst. Would you look down at verse 25 now? Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved. Now we know this is John, the beloved, who is writing this account. He never mentions his own name. But when he sees Mary and he sees John standing there, it says, He saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took her unto his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was a, there was set a vessel of full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar, (coughs) and put it upon hyssop, and put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Look at verse 17, if you would, one more time. And he, bearing his cross, went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew, Golgotha. Now, Golgotha is the Aramaic name, but it's also referred to as Calvary, for example, in Luke's gospel account. That is the Latin form 
of the same word, but it's a, it's a particular hill that is located right outside of the city of Jerusalem. Now, we don't know the exact location of it today. There's a lot of speculation, but based upon historical evidence outside of Scripture, we believe that it was right there outside the city, right outside the, the city gates. But both Calvary and Golgotha mean the place of the skull. And it was named that because many believe that it appeared, or whenever they looked at it, it appeared to them to be the image of a, of a human skull. Now, it's not the, part, the, the skull part with the eyes and the nose socket, but rather it's the skull cap. And so that also is in that Latin understanding of that translation. But it is an appropriate name because of its appearance, not only because of that, but also because of the events that took place there on Golgotha, the events that ultimately, ultimately ended in death. It was a place of public execution, Roman style. In other words, crucifixion. Now I confess this afternoon, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time in this message talking about the details of, in the processes of, of Jesus' crucifixion. We're only given so many details. A lot of it we get from extra, extra biblical history and, and documentation. But I don't want to spend a lot of time about the method of crucifixion. It might surprise you, but the Bible is somewhat silent about the specifics involved in the, cruci the crucifixion. John's gospel is the, is the one that has the most details in it. The rest of the New Testament never speaks on the specific details of the historical crucifixion of Jesus. Now certainly the authors of the New Testament, they, they refer to Jesus' sacrifice, they refer to his atoning death, and they refer to you know, the cross and stuff like that, but, but the exact procedures of his crucifixion and all that they did to him on his way to the cross and while on the cross, you won't find those details in the Bible. And so, for that reason, I just want to spend a few moments this afternoon just discussing, you know, crucifixion in and of itself. So, so the, the realities of crucifixion. But then I want to move on to the reason for Jesus' crucifixion. And then we'll finish with the result of his crucifixion. So the realities, the reason, and the result. First of all, the realities. The facts surrounding crucifixion. Though it didn't originate with them, history tells us that the Romans were the ones who perfected this cruel and, and, and this painful form of execution. History tells us uh, that, it, it, that it was unlike any other uh, kind of execution in that day. In fact, it's very much different from the kind of uh, execution that we have for criminals today. Uh, a process in which, you know, we try to make it as humane as possible, as painless as possible, as quick as possible. Listen, crucifixion was anything but that. Crucifixion was intended to inflict, to inflict the most amount of pain for the most amount of time to send the most impactful message to the rest of the people. That's what crucifixion was all about. While the point was execution, crucifixion was also marked by humiliation. You see, the one who was being crucified, whether it was a man or whether it was a woman, the one who was being crucified would be stripped completely naked in front of the public eye. Oftentimes, beatings, mocking, floggings would take place, which we also read about happened with, with Jesus there. They, they would, uh, the, those who were convicted uh, would have to carry their crosses to the place of their execution or to the place of the crucifixion. They would be led along paths amongst uh, public crowds, which we also see in the account with Jesus. And, and they would be led along uh, the roadways so that public eye would be able to see and that that message would not be forgotten, that you don't commit crimes against Caesar, you don't commit crimes against Rome. And also for that purpose, they would leave the bodies oftentimes on the crosses hanging long after they were dead. So everybody looking would say, oh yeah, we don't go against Rome. Due to the fact that it was considered such a reprehensible and shameful way to die, Rome tended not to crucify its own citizens, though it wasn't unheard of. It was a cruelty generally reserved for executing slaves and insurrectionists and murderers and those who Rome designated as criminals of the highest and vilest sort who, created, who committed the most heinous crimes against Caesar and against Rome. Or, or it was a one that was reserved for people who Rome just wanted to make a public example out of. It's cruelty is generally reserved for those kinds of people, but not limited to. It was so brutal that Cicero himself called it a most cruel and disgusted punishment. 
He claimed that the very mention of the cross should be far removed from not only from a Roman citizen's body, but from his mind, his, his eyes, and his ears. And then on another occasion, he stated, it is a crime to bind a Roman citizen. To scourge him is a wickedness. To put him to death is almost parasite. But what shall I say of crucifying him? So guilty an action cannot by any possibility be adequately expressed by any name bad enough for it. Cicero wasn't the only one who had a distaste for crucifixion. Many in Rome did. But because he was the lawyer and the statesman and somewhat of a politician, his voice was carried more weight. But regardless, it was hard. It was hard for them to argue uh, with the fact that crucifixions were, were very effective in deterring the crime against Rome. And therefore, Rome continued its practice, at least until Constantine came into power, and, and he uh, abolished it in the 4th century A.D. After all of the abuse, though, and after all the torment that was inflicted upon a person through crucifixion, death, you can imagine, was generally a welcomed relief to those people hanging on the cross. In fact, it was considered an act of mercy for them to come along with a club that was designed especially for this, and they would break the legs of the people hanging on the cross so that they could no longer support their weight with their legs, and, and, and then they would just have to slump there, and they were having weakened arms. They could not bring themselves up to take in a breath. And so they would succumb to asphyxiation or suffocation. That's how most of them died on the cross. Depending on the method of crucifixion, it could take upwards to four days hanging on a cross for a person to die. And there are a lot of different ways, but up to four days. In fact, it is because of the intense amount of pain and the length of the suffering in crucifixion that we have the term that we have today, excruciating. Which literally translated means out of crucifying or out of the cross. One last thing I do want to mention under this point of the realities of crucifixion, and I believe it will flow right into the next point, which is the reason for Jesus' crucifixion. You see it in verse 17. There we read, And he bearing his cross went forth into a place. And I know you probably don't think there's much value in that statement, but that word went forth. And the phrase is translated even more times in our King James Bibles as the words go out. In fact, 60 times in total, it's translated as to go out. And that is in keeping with the other gospel accounts where it says that Jesus was led outside of the city or outside of the city walls of Jerusalem. You see, the law didn't permit crucifixion to take place or to be performed within the walls of Jerusalem. And again, I know you're thinking, well, that's really not that big of a deal. Hang in there with me. But this is why Golgotha was a prime location for the Romans because it was located right outside the city. And in fact, history tells us that it was located right along a main road, so there would be a lot of foot traffic, a lot of witnesses, a lot of people who would just be passing by on that day who happen to look up and they see this crucifixion taking place and they'd be reminded of Rome's rule over them. Not only that, but it was an elevated place. Golgotha is a, is a hill. It's that hill far away where there stood an old rugged cross that we sing about. That's what Golgotha is. And so it was prime in order for them to hold crucifixions there. People, even from a far distance, could see what was taking place on that hill. Now, the reason I do point this out is because it adds to the picture of Jesus Christ. Now, catch this as the sacrificial lamb of God. You say, well, how? How does, how does that add to the picture? According to the instructions on the Old Testament law, in regards to the remains of the animal sacrifices for sins, after the high priest had sprinkled the blood of those animal sacrifices there within the sanctuary, they would then take the remains of that animal and they would burn it outside of the city gates. You say, I, I still don't make the connection. Well, let the author of Hebrews make it for you. Hebrews chapter 13, 11, and 12, the author there writes, For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. But then in verse 12 he writes, Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. There's a correlation even there. 
That detail lends to the Old Testament imagery of Jesus Christ that he is the sacrificial lamb of God who died for the sins of the world. That's the title that John the Baptist gave to Jesus as he came to him there in the wilderness where John was baptizing. That, in the Old Testament, the people would bring their, their sacrificial lambs and they would offer them. They were unblemished. They were without spot, without blemish to be slain on their behalf, not because of anything that the lamb did, but because of what they had done. And that, first of all, showed that they acknowledged that they were sinners. It was the acknowledgement of their sinfulness. They're, it also acknowledged the, that they were repenting from those past sins of the previous year, and it was a sign of faith of the promised sacrifice that God had said he would send. And so just in bringing that animal, it had a lot of symbolism to it. You know, not even realizing what he was saying. Abraham, when he spoke, when he spoke to Isaac, his son, he spoke of this when he said God will provide himself a lamb. In fact, he, he also served as a picture of how God was going to do it, didn't he? Willing to sacrifice his own son. But God wasn't just willing, he did sacrifice his son. Again, the author of Hebrews explains that those Old Testament sacrifices cast a shadow of good things to come. They were only a foreshadow. They were only a foreshadow of, of, of which Jesus on the cross of Golgotha had cast for the Old Testament saints to look forward to. They were a foreshadow of Jesus' substitutional death on the cross for sinners. Substitutional death, substitutional atonement. Romans 5, 6 tells us very plainly, Christ died for the ungodly. We're also told, Romans 5, 8, but God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And then 1 Corinthians 15, 3, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Christ is that sacrificial lamb that is brought on the behalf of the sinners and slain for the rest of the world. But still the question remains, why? Why did, why did this happen? Why did Jesus have to die for our sins? Well, let's just make it personal. Why did Jesus have to die for my sins? Why Jesus? What was the reason for Jesus' crucifixion? That's point two. What was the reason for his crucifixion and his, his death? We can answer that question by examining one of the recorded sayings of Jesus while he hung there on the cross. And we read it earlier. It's found in verse 30. And this is really what I want to build the remainder of the message on is the, using this as a springboard. It says, when Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. You know, Jesus is the only man ever, ever, who is qualified to proclaim that in the context in which he did. I'm going to say it one more time so that you get the, the significance and the gravity of that statement. He, Jesus, is the only man ever who was qualified to proclaim that statement in the context in which he did. Only Jesus. Notice Jesus didn't say, I am finished. He didn't say, oh, my life is finished. He said, it is finished. What exactly was Jesus talking about when he said, it is finished? What exactly was he saying there on the cross? His final words as he then bows his head and gives up the ghost. In the Greek, that three word phrase is a single word. It's the word tetelestai. And it carries the idea of being fully paid or paid in full. In fact, in John MacArthur's uh, commentary, he writes of, a, of papyri that had been found, of tax documents that had been blotted out and instead written across was that word, tetelestai, paid in full. All those taxes were paid in full. They were all done away with, blotted out. He's, Jesus says this in the context of what was taking place there on the hill of Golgotha. Not concerning some taxes that needed to be paid, but a greater spiritual debt that needed to be paid. Not simply the pain and the nails and the crown on his head or the thirst or the exhaustion or the ridicule or even the rejection. That's not what it is that he's talking about. That's not what causes him to say this. 
God poured out all his wrath upon all, uh, for all sin upon Jesus while he was on the cross. That's what he's talking about when he says it is finished. The wrath of God for our sin, which we looked at last week in the message of Gethsemane, that full cup of wrath had now been poured out upon the cross and he took it for us. And after he did, he said, the Bible says, knowing that all things have been accomplished. Then he says, it is finished. Done what I've come to done. Amen? Drop the mic. But God wasn't finished yet. Amen? We get to look at that next week. It is finished. To tell us that Jesus bore its full weight, and in doing so, he gave his life. He bowed his head and gave up the ghost. You know, this bothers me because there are so many people today who seem to think that their debt of sin can be paid for by themselves. They believe that if they could just do enough, then they can cover their bad sins with all the good deeds that they do. If they can be generous enough, charitable enough, kind enough, nice enough, religious enough, good enough, then they can make up for and they can pay off the debt of their sins. But there's a lot of different flaws in that, in that mentality. One thing that they don't understand is that our God that they have sinned against is an eternal God. Amen? He's eternal, and his righteousness is an eternal righteousness, which means you may have been bad yesterday, but guess what? God was still good yesterday, and he's still good today, and he's going to be good tomorrow. You're not guaranteed you're going to be good tomorrow. God is an eternal God, and his righteousness is eternal, meaning that in no time, since the very beginning, and in that no time, all the way up through the very ending, has God, or is God, or will God not be righteous. Is this too much for you after eating a full meal? Our God is righteous. It's a fundamental fact concerning his character. He is righteous to the core. His actions, his actions are not only righteous. Listen, he is righteousness. He is the epitome of righteousness, the source of righteousness. He manifests righteousness. Everything that he does and everything that he is, is righteous. Don't take my word for it. It's one of the most proclaimed uh, uh, attributes of God throughout all the word, uh, all of his word. I just got a few for you. Ezra 9, 15a clearly states, O Lord God of Israel, thou art righteous. Psalm 116, 5, gracious is the Lord and righteous, yea, our God is merciful. Daniel 9, 14 declares, for the Lord our God is righteous in all his works which he doeth. Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 4, he is the rock, his work is perfect for all the ways, of ju all the ways are, are judgment, a God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he, which by the way the word just is the same word that's translated righteous. One more for you, Revelation 16, 5, John wrote, and I heard the angel of the water say, thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and was and shalt be because thou hast judged thus. He's righteous even in his judgment, Amen. From eternity past all the way through eternity future, God and his righteousness is eternal. And so to sin against an eternal God who is eternally righteous, guess what? That brings an eternal consequence. See where I was going with that now? It's not just some light thing that you can deal with because you've done some good stuff. I'm afraid that no man who's born of the seed of Adam can pay that debt himself. No man. And yet the debt must be paid. It has to be. And the debt will be paid. It will be paid because justice must be served on sin. If God does not see to it that justice is served for every sin that is committed, but if he were to allow it, just even one sin to slip on by without being dealt with and being judged, then God is not a just God, which makes him unjust. That was hard. If he's unjust, then he's not righteous because that makes him unrighteous because he's unjust. And I think I've already made it pretty clear by God's word that God is eternally righteous. No man. No man born of the seed of Adam can pay the debt that their sin has incurred. But they themselves, they themselves are sinners 
who needs someone else who's not a sinner to handle their debt with this eternal God who's eternally righteous. No man with a born under the blood of Adam because they have the inherited Adamic sin nature by the fall in the garden. Everything that man could offer God as atonement or as a full payment for sin would in itself be, would, be, uh, would have sin dripping off of it. You understand that? And an eternally righteous God won't touch it. Filthy rags. According to Isaiah, and I, I dare not explain the full understanding of what those rags are. It's like if you were to fall into a swimming pool and you'd be sopping wet from head to toe. But then you hear a voice say, here, let me dry you off with my towel. And so you look around to find the voice that said that only to see that there's another man who's also in the pool with you, sopping wet from head to toe. And he reaches under the surface of the water and he brings out his towel. He says, here, let me dry you off with my towel. Friends, that's what it's like whenever we as sinners or anybody tries to pay for their sins. It can't be done. You see, sinful man cannot pay the debt of sin for others because he cannot pay the eternal debt of sin for himself. The consequence of all who die without having their sins atoned for. The consequence of all who die without having their, 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 their sins paid for, to tell us die, fully paid, is an eternal consequence. I think it's clear mankind can never Pay the eternal debt of sin. You cannot make up for the eternal debt of sin that you have accrued before this holy, righteous God. There's only one who can. And it's God. Only God could do it. Because only God is eternally without sin. Now you know why I harped on him being eternally righteous. That means he's eternally without sin as well. So now the question is, how can an eternal God who cannot die atone for the sins of the world? He cannot die. He's, he's eternal. He can't die. And yet in his word, he's very clear. The wages of sin is death. Now, we have an understanding of that, not, but... I, you have, to, you have to have a deeper understanding. If it's true for one side, it's true on the other side as well. That verse right there, not only is the payoff from sin, death for those who sin, but also the payment for sinners to be redeemed likewise require death. A perfect sinless death. A perfect sinless death which results from the shedding of perfect sinless blood. Again, it's the picture of the Old Testament sacrificial system that it was presenting to us, Hebrews makes the point again, without the shedding of blood is no remission. Without the shedding of blood is no remission. That word remission refers to forgiveness or the forgiveness of sins. It's the Greek word aphesis, meaning freedom, pardon, deliverance, forgiveness, liberty, remission. It's the idea of being in bondage uh, because of a debt that was hanging over you and then having that debt fully paid off so that now you're free and all is forgiven. That's the idea of this word, remission. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. But now our question is compounded, isn't it? First of all, how can a God who is eternal die? Now, how can a God who is spirit bleed? How can his blood wash away our sins whenever he's spirit? How does this God pay the debt of sin that only he can pay? Again, the only way is if he were to become a man. Flesh and blood. And so that's exactly what God did. He became a man. They gave him the name Jesus. He's born of a virgin. He lived his life. And then when the hour had come, you remember John 17, 1, as he's going out to the garden, he prayed to the Father there, Father, the hour has come, glorify thy Son, that thy Son may also glorify thee. When the hour had come, Jesus laid his life down, his perfect sinless life. You do realize his life was not taken from him. He didn't lose his life, he gave up his life. He laid it down. He, he himself said, no man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have, the power to, to lay, I have the power to lay it down and I have the power to take it up again. 
Jesus, the eternal Son of God, being God, equal to the Father in all deity. He's very much as God as God is God. He paid the eternal debt of sin at Golgotha when he shed his blood for our sins, for all sins. That's what he meant when Jesus said it is finished. The debt of sin has been paid in full. The wrath of God has been completely satisfied. There's nothing else that needs to be done. It is finished. And therefore, whenever we hear those words read, or whenever we hear those words said, our hearts should rejoice, our knees should bow, we should bend and bow before Jesus, and with uplifted hands we should say, Thank you, God! Thank you! Worthy are you, God! Revelation chapter 5, verse 12. Worthy is the lamb that was slain. According to the praise, worthy it says to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Worthy is the lamb. Now the words of John the Baptist, whenever Jesus came out in John 1, 29, now they make sense. Behold the lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Now the Old Testament sacrificial system makes sense to us. Lambs being brought to the altar, their innocent life being taken on behalf of the guilty. The blood being spilled and poured down over the mercy seat that flowed down upon the ark of God, which, which was symbolic of his, of his presence with them. Listen, it was all a sign. It was all a symbol. It was all just a, a picture of what foreshadowed Christ as he was there on Golgotha. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the spotless Lamb of God, who gave his innocent life on behalf of the guilty. The innocent died for the guilty. He who was sinless died for us who are sinful. That's what happened on Golgotha. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. And by the way, me saying that and you consenting to it is more than just nodding your head or saying amen. He is so worthy of me sanctifying and sacrificing my whole life, my whole being to his authority. Once you understand the sacrifice of Jesus for you at Golgotha, there is nothing too great for you to sacrifice for him. When you really understand it. Maybe you'll get up. and Hit some wood and scream it to the top of your lungs as well. It is finished. Yes, praise God. Because I will not have to answer for my sins. And be judged for them. Yes! Worthy is that lamb. All judgment for my sins has been atoned for by the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross at Golgotha. It is finished, paid in full. And that is the result, by the way, point number three. That's the result of Jesus' crucifixion on the hill of Golgotha. Paul writes in Ephesians 1, 7, speaking of Jesus, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. I'm excited about it. Are you? Is it even a blip in the radar of your life? Does it make a difference? Has it made a change? Does it produce fruit? Does it cause that transformation? events of, Golg of Golgotha and the cross that Jesus bore. That was Jesus drinking the cup of God's wrath for sin. And let me just tell you, he drank it all the way down to the bottom to every last drop. Meaning there's nothing left in the cup of God's wrath for my sin. I will not have to pay the eternal consequences for my sin because Jesus paid it. I will not have to be judged in eternity because of my sin because Jesus was judged in my stead and in my place on the cross. Instead, listen church, this is what I get to do. I get to stand before the beam of seat of Christ. And I don't get judged for bad behavior. I get rewarded. I get rewarded for the things that I've done and how I've lived my life to the glory of God Almighty. That's my judgment. What about yours? What about yours? 
Now, for the Christian, the fittest work of Jesus Christ on that cross, it is the object upon which we set our eyes on as we walk throughout this life. There, there's nobody here, not, not one. I'm talking to believers here. There's not one here who is too committed to this Jesus. Nobody. There's no Christian here that can look at the cross and look at Golgotha in honesty and think to themselves, oh, I've done enough for my Savior. I've given up so much. I've committed so much. I've done so much that I can rest easy now and just wait for the reward of heaven. No, nobody here can say that. The cross is what motivates us to press on and to move forward for the cause of Christ, our Savior. When we look at Golgotha, listen, we're not broken necessarily. It should amp us up. If my Savior did that for me, goodness, what am I going to do for Him? If you're a Christian, it ought to amp you up and ought to get you excited. If it doesn't do that for you this, this afternoon, Christian, then, then maybe, maybe you just need to revisit Golgotha today. Dear brother and sister, maybe you need to revisit Golgotha and walk up that hill, kneel down at that cross, look up at that Savior, that lamb that was slain before the foundations of the, wool, of the world and wipe the scales of worldliness off your eyes that's blinding you from the truth that stands there. All the, the worldly success and the worldly pleasures and the, the worldly achievements and the worldly fame and the lust that are there. Listen, wipe it off and look at Golgotha again. Like you did the first time you received Christ, the very moment that you received Christ. Look again at the events, look at the register, look at the register, look at the tax documents that, that, that has Tetelestai written across it saying it's all paid in full. You no longer are indebted because of your sins. Goodness, look at the Lamb's Book of Life, amen? Look at the Lamb's Book of Life, look at your name that's been written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And by the way, it isn't in your handwriting either. Because somebody else wrote it for you, his name's Jesus. Look at these things. Look again and you will realize I've not done enough. I've not given enough until my whole life, every breath, every beat of my heart, until I've given it all over to Jesus as my Lord and my Savior. So what happens when you look at Golgotha? Not one believer who's been saved by the blood can honestly look at it and say, I've done enough. Look again. Look again. Might I also just take a moment to say to those of you who are not, you're not born again children of God. You say, well, well, how do I know if I am or if I'm not? You'll know. If you are, you know it. If you don't know it, you're not. If you don't know how to become a child of God, then you're not. Because you've got to know in order to become. And so for those of you who, who are not born again children of God today, and let, me, let me just say, there is no soul here today that the blood of Jesus Christ shed on the cross cannot save. Nobody. There's no sin or sins that you have committed that's greater than the grace of God to save you. None at all. If you, if you would just believe on, D, on Jesus, this one who hung on the cross, who took of the full wrath of God for your sins, if you would turn away from the sinful living and you instead turn to Jesus Christ, repenting of all that you've been putting your faith and your trust in leading up to this point in time, but instead place it all in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross of Golgotha, listen, you too will have your sins forgiven and you too will be, have, have telesi, to telesi written across, paid in full. You will be saved. You're not a Christian. I hope you seriously consider these words. If you're playing today as a Christian, seriously consider these words. As it stands right now in your condition, the cross of Jesus Christ is not good news for you. 
As it stands in your condition, lost person, the cross of Jesus Christ is not good for you. And this is not a good time of the year to celebrate. Because the scripture says that you still remain dead in your trespasses and sins. And therefore the wrath of God abideth on you. Jesus took the full wrath of God for sins, but you got to receive it or else by default, God's wrath will then be turned upon you. Because you haven't received the forgiveness for your sins. Because you, you, you have not received the atonement that Jesus has already paid for your sins. Upon the day of your death, rest assured payment will be required of you in heaven or in eternity. If you're here today and this describes you, all I can say is fall at his feet. Fall at the feet of Jesus and cry out to him, acknowledge him, acknowledge your sinfulness, turn from your sinfulness, turn to him, believe on him, receive him as your Lord and your Savior, forsaking all else, Jesus and Jesus alone. Believe on him and he will save you. Amen. Amen. Golgotha. The place that was known for the death of criminals and the consequence of their personal sins. Now a reminder of the death of sin's eternal consequences for those who are in Jesus Christ. To some, it, it is a terror. But to others, it is our victory and it is our joy. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Worthy is the Lamb.